listen only mode. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar Intro to M1. We're going to be going over the M1 hardware today and that will include our controls, expanders and accessories for our M1 security and automation control line. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar and there is a questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel to allow you to send us those questions. So please feel free to send any questions that you have. We'll get to as many questions as we can during the session. Um, if we do have unanswered questions, uh, maybe we run out of time or maybe your question is, is more involved and we need to be able to provide that answer to you after the webinar, we will do that via a follow-up email. Um, we're going to be sending you an email after the webinar, typically we get that sent out on Monday and that email is going to include a copy of the presentation that you're going to be seeing today as well as a link to a recording of this session and we'll also provide some other resources that we think you'll find helpful including a, a question and answer summary from the webinar. So what I'd like to do now to, to start things off is just ask you a question. So I'm going to launch a poll on your screen. We want to see just how familiar you are with the M1 system. I'm just trying to get a, a feel for our audience here. So if you would please answer the question that you'll be seeing on your screen now. And I'll give you a few seconds to get that answer in. Again, we're just trying to find out um, who our audience is and how familiar you are with the system. Maybe you're completely new to it, you've never installed one, or maybe you've done a few installs. Uh, maybe you've done quite a few installs and you're just looking for a refresher here. I'm going to leave that up for about another 10 seconds or so. Okay, thank you to everyone who answered that question for us. And it does look like the majority of our audience here has never installed an M1 system, although we do have some folks with us today have done one or two installations. So um, we really hope that uh, we're able to give you some information here today that's beneficial. And, you know, uh, if you're new to M1, you're definitely going to learn a lot to, about it. And if you've um, installed a few systems, you're still going to hopefully get some information that's new to you that's helpful for future installations. So let's go ahead and dive in and start talking about the M1. Um, the M1 is our security and automation control solution. Um, we have an M1 Gold and an M1 Easy 8, and we'll go over the difference between those here in just a few minutes. But um, basically what M1 is, uh, is a powerful, flexible, and intelligent control solution. It combines security, access control, energy management, you know, through lighting and thermostat control and that sort of thing, and other integrated control. I mean, you can control a lot of different things with M1, um, you know, looking at like garage doors, gates, pumps, and that, you know, that sort of thing, water shut off valves. There's a lot of different things that you can control with the M1. And by having all of that under one platform, um, you know, one brain, so to speak, you're really going to be able to maximize the convenience of the system, um, provide simplicity through, you know, one basic control platform for all of that, and increase, uh, you know, the comfort and uh, enhance the lifestyles of your customers. And, one thing that uh, we do want to point out is, you know, M1 is uh, definitely great for residences, but it's also great for businesses, restaurants, uh, fitness centers, schools, um, government buildings, municipal buildings. There's, you know, M1s are installed in a lot of different places, so um, definitely don't try to box it into just a residential control because you can have one control solution with M1 that is going to work for your um, homes, whether they be, you know, um, modest homes up to very large high-end homes, and also for a wide variety of businesses. So you can learn one product and you know apply it to a bunch of different installations, and that can be helpful for your company to you know be able to have a, a control solution that does all of that. So again, just try diving into the different things that can be integrated. Um, of course, we've got security and life safety. Um, you know, M1 is for security and, and fire and carbon monoxide, water sensing, all of those different things. Um, you can also um, control things like lights, window coverings. You 
garage doors, thermostats. Um, you can control, control uh, doors and gates with, you know, through integrated locks, through electronic locks like mag locks, door strikes, and that sort of thing for access control, which is great for commercial applications. Um, you can control things like sprinklers and pumps, um, water heaters. Um, electric water heaters can be controlled through a product that we offer. And um, we do have a, a way now that you can even control um, the uh, gas top water heaters um, through a product that's made by another company that's controlled through an automation device. So we can provide some information on that if you're interested in that. Um, we also can um, do leak detection and shut off the water so, uh, and you know, any kind of small appliances. So there's just a lot that you can control with this one system. All right, now let's kind of talk about um, the two different systems. And again, we have the M1 Gold and we have the M1 Easy 8. The M1 Gold being the, um, the full featured system that has all of the features and the M1 Easy 8 is a smaller uh, system for those installations where you don't really need all of the features of a Gold, but you still want to have a lot of the, the capability of the M1. So um, differences are going to be um, things like the zones. Um, you've got 16 onboard zones with an M1 Gold and you've got eight onboard zones with an M1 Easy 8. So they both have wireless capability, up to 144 of the zones can be wireless, but you're looking at 208 total zones on an M1 Gold and 200 total zones on an Easy 8. The Easy 8 does not have the voice capability, so there's one less onboard output, and that's the output that's missing is the voice output. Um, but you, also, you, you still have a siren output uh, on both systems, a relay output, and some voltage outputs on board. And both systems have expansion capability for outputs up to you know, 200 plus outputs, which can be either voltage outputs or relays or any you know, combination of those two. As I stated before, M1 Gold has voice alerts. Now that's your voice on site. Um, that also can be through voice alerts that are delivered by making a phone call over a standard phone line and you know giving the customer a, a message that you know something has happened. Maybe a, a child's arrived home from school, or there's a temperature um, that's out of uh, range, or there's been a water leak, or something like that. With the M1 Gold, you can have um, optional two-way listening for alarm verification, and that is not available on an M1 Easy 8. So those are the main differences between the systems. They do have a lot of common features. Um, you have six arming levels, um, away, vacation, and the main difference between away and vacation is going to be um, just that you can you know, set up some automation things related to vacation. If you're going to be gone a longer period of time, maybe you want to you know, have more drastic setbacks on your thermostats, uh, maybe incorporate a uh, lighting scheme that makes it look like there's people there, that kind of thing. But as far as what's actually armed on your zones, it's going to be the same. Then you have stay and stay instant and night and night instant. So the stay instant and night instant eliminate the entry delays, even for zones that are programmed to have entry delays. But the main difference between stay and night is going to be which zones are armed. So you can set zones up as night zones and they will be active when the system is armed in night mode, um, but they won't be active when the system is armed in stay mode. So that allows you to uh, you know, provide more interior security at night. Both systems support up to 199 users, and when we say users, what we're talking about there are ARM disarm codes and also access credentials, so 199 combined, and you can have, again, any combination of user codes or um, cards fobs or, or even access-related codes for access keypads. Both systems can be partitioned into up to eight areas, and so that allows you to have different areas and they're armed and disarmed independently. You can also have different account numbers for those areas for your reporting purposes. Each has a 512 event history log, and that um, stores events you know, related to arming and disarming, alarm events, access events, that sort of thing, troubles, that, that kind of thing. And both systems feature a built-in astronomical clock. And what that allows the system to do is know when it's light and dark outside based on your um, geographic location so that you can incorporate that into your automation so that you can have smart control of your lights and that sort of thing. 
We have a, a question here about the two systems, and this is a very good question. Um, does the M1 EZ8 support third-party automation? And the answer is yes. Um, all of the automation partners that we work with for the M1 Gold uh, that you'll find listed on our website and then we'll talk about here in just a moment are available on both systems. Now let's talk about the keypad options that you have with M1, and we have a lot of different keypads, uh, you know, different styles to meet different tastes and decor, that sort of thing, and also, you know, you may have, uh, you know, different needs for what you want the keypad to do. So you kind of see in an overview of the keypads that we have to offer. Um, the two larger keypads in the back, the M1 KPB and KP keypads, um, have six function keys, um, whereas like the KP2 and the KP3 have four function keys. Um, with the M1 KP Navigator, which is a touchscreen type keypad, um, you have access to all six function keys. And also on the M1 KPAS, which you see on the left there, um, the one that doesn't have a display, it just has a few LEDs, you also have access to the six function keys there. So that arming station is great for areas where you don't necessarily need a lot of information. You want to have a small, discrete keypad that you can arm and disarm from and activate some functions and that sort of thing. Really great keypad there, and it fits into the decor style. Uh, plates um, so you can have that either in like a single gang or even a double or triple gang if you have um, other things going on there but um, so that makes a really nice discreet looking keypad um, installation for those areas where you don't necessarily need a lot of information now a lot of times I get asked about the navigator um, you know do you have to have another keypad on the system um, one of the LCDs when you're using the navigator can it do programming that sort of thing um, the navigator keypad actually has all of the programming capabilities capabilities of all of the other keypads that you see here. The only one you can't program from is the arming station. So you're going to be able to navigate through those programming menus and actually it has a really nice layout with the way the program menus are on the navigator and it's a very popular keypad so it's definitely one to, to pay attention to. Now here we have a keypad comparison, and I'm not going to go over every point of this. Um, I just want um, you to know that this information is here, and um, that you're going to be able to, you know, reference that. And the follow-up email will be sending you this presentation, so you'll have this co comparison of the keypads. And just to point out things that could be different, you know, I mentioned the function keys, um, you know, whether or not you can have a proximity reader, um, you know, whether or not it has a door, you know, just things like that. The color of the display; those are going to be the things that are different. And also, you know, your mounting options. Um, the M1 KP2 keypad is um, really the only one that is considered a flush mount keypad, so if you are looking for a flush mount option, um, that would be the one to look at. You do need a special back box for that, and then of course the arming station again mounts into a, an electrical box, like a single gang. And the M1 KPAS does have a sounder to provide uh, feedback for beeps and, and tones for trouble conditions and, and chime and that sort of thing. Did have a question about that. So. So let's talk a little bit about the other ways that you might interface with an M1 system. And of course, these are the things that are really popular now with the, with everyone, you know, wanting to be able to use um, their electronic devices, whether that be their PC, you know, laptop, or their uh, tablet, or their phone. Um, so we're you know kind of giving you an overview here of the different ways that you can control the system through those things. Um, so the first one that we're talking about here is the Elk Link Mobile, and this is a new app that is available from Elk. It is an app that is free, and it is pairs with our C1M1 device that we will tell you about here in just a bit. Our C1M1 is a dual path alarm communicator that provides an IPN cellular pathway for reporting as well as some remote features, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. But um, Elk Link Mobile is available for iOS and Android, and and again, that is a free app. Elk also offers a free software solution for Windows computers, and that's called m one to go You can download that from our website, and that provides a really nice interface for your, again, your, your PC, your laptop, um, running a Windows operating system. It gives you a lot of control over the system, over the security and automation and that sort of thing, so it's a, a great free software solution. 
We also have some options available from third parties. Um, eKeypad is a family of apps available for the iOS devices, and so that's going to be your iPad, your iPhone, and they even have a solution for the Apple Watch. And so, you know, the, there are different apps available in that family, and, you know, how much the app does varies between the different versions of it. You can have a very basic version of it and a very, you know, full featured version of it. So um, there are different uh, flavors of the eKeypad and you'll want to reference their website for details on, you know, which one's the best fit for a particular installation. For Android devices, a third-party app called M1 Touch Pro is available, and it does provide a, a very rich interface to the M1 system, allowing control of security and automation type things. Um, and then we also have our cloud partner, Connect One, and they offer cloud-based services. There are monthly fees involved with their services, um, and they have support for pretty much any web-enabled device. So they have, um, you know, browser-based support as well as app-based support, and they also provide some pretty neat features um, for um, user management and other types of uh, reporting and that sort of thing. So if you're, you know, looking for a cloud-based solution, you want to check out Connect One. So as we were talking about before, um, the in, you know integration with third party on both the M1 Gold and the M1 EZ8, um, we have a lot of different partners that we can work with for lighting control and thermostats and software and user interfaces and um, you know just all, all different kinds of things that uh, that we can interface the M1 with. And so you you see a kind of an overview of our partner list here. Um, we keep a, an up to date list on our website at elkproducts.com, so you definitely want to check that out. And that's more than just a list; it's a really great resource if you are wanting to research um, what partners are available and also learn more about how the M1 interfaces with them. It does break that down for you and tell you what parts are needed and you know if we've ever done any kind of uh, training webinar or anything on it you'd find a link to it there you know any documentation that we have so that is a really great resource that you need to be taking advantage of when you're working with some of our partners we have all that information in one place for you. So going forward with the webinar here, we're going to focus more on the M1 Gold. Again, don't forget about the M1 Easy 8, but we are going to focus on it so that you can understand everything that it does. And so I'm going to go over the different kits that we have available for the M1 Gold at this point. Um, so the kits are going to have a lot of similar similarities in what they offer. Of course, they're going to have a control, you know, the M1 Gold, the battery transformer, a speaker for the voice output, a surge protector, and a telco jack. Every kit that you see here offers those things. So what's different is going to be the keypad that's specced with it, whether or not it has an enclosure, and then we also have, um, and if you look in the upper right here, the two-way ready kit. And so if you are interested in our two-way wireless, which again we will go into a lot more detail on that here in just a moment, but if you are interested in that, uh, I definitely recommend this kit, um, the M1 GSYS4 STW, as it's priced at a play, uh, at a level where you're going to be getting that wireless transceiver for free. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. You also get a wireless key fob with that kit. Um, but again, you know, if you see um, we've got uh, the M1KP and the uh, GSIS-4 and the GK, the M1KP2 and the GSIS-4S and the GKS, and then we also offer the M1 GSIS-3, which is a kit that contains no keypad, and that is to allow you to spec it, um, one of the other keypads, say if you want the M1KPB with the blue display or the M1KP3 or the M1KP navigator. So at this point, we're going to start going over system layout and expansion overview, and I would like to um, introduce Brad Weeks, our tech support manager. He's going to be taking the presentation from this point and going over all of the information that you need on wiring and installation of an M1. All right. Thank you, Amy. I certainly appreciate that, and we appreciate everyone's time and attendance today. So right now, we're going to, if we don't have any questions up to this point, we're going to start with system layout and expansion overview, wiring and installation tips, and hopefully by the end of our webinar today, your experience will be a lot more uh, enjoyable than our gentleman here 
uh, at the bottom of our slide. All right. Right now, let's talk about the M1 Gold Terminal Overview. And what we're looking at is the M1 Gold Main Control. And on the upper left-hand corner of the board, we have our 16 onboard zones. Below that, we have our AC input and our auxiliary DC output, as well as our voltage outputs. Our master on-off switch. Below that is our battery leads for our backup battery. Upper right-hand corner, we have our hardwired landline tele telephone communication connections. We have an RS-232 port. We call that port zero. Middle of the right-hand side, we have output through 16 and then outputs 1 through 3 and then our RS-485 data bus connection. Uh, the very bottom of the enclosure, the black plastic housing, each M1 system has a unique serial number. And that's an eight digit number, starts with zero. That's an important piece of information when you're using the RP software to connect to the system because each M1 has its own unique serial number. No two serial numbers have been duplicated. So you'll need to know that in order to uh, use the RP software and connect to the system. Now the green terminal blocks on the M1 Gold are removable. So if for some reason you need to take the M1 out, you just simply remove the terminal blocks without having to disconnect your wires. Let's talk about the zone inputs on the board. There are 16 of them, uh, and we do have the green removable terminal blocks. Each zone may be configured with the end-of-line supervised resistor or without. So you can either use normally open or normally closed contacts with or without the resistor. The end-of-line resistor is a 2.2K ohm. It's included in the hardware pack. Now, for those that uh, aren't going to be able to install the resistor at the sensor itself, uh, I would suggest not even including it because uh, if you include it at the panel, it really is not serving its purpose. The purpose for the end-of-line resistor is to supervise the wiring going out to the sensor so that in the event a nail should happen to short out the wire, the M1 would know that and that would be a zone trouble condition. If the resistor is at the panel, and that scenario of a, a nail, a screw, or a staple should happen to short the wire, the M1's not going to know the difference. So that zone is basically disabled, and unless you opened the zone and looked at the keypad, you would never know that that trouble existed. So the purpose of the end-of-line resistor is to supervise the wiring, and it should be at the furthest point at the sensor itself. Each zone does share a, neighbor, a negative with its neighbor, so you can see in our little diagram here, we have zone one, negative, zone two, three, negative, so multiple zones, there could be two wires under the negative terminal. The negative on the M1 board are all common to each other, they're all referenced back to the DC negative of the battery. Zone 16 on the M1 system is a little different. This is the only zone that will accept two wire smoke detectors. Uh, you can have up to 20 detectors daisy chained together. Those must be compatible two wire smoke. So t if you have an opportunity, you can download our installation manual. Take a look at page six of the installation manual for a complete list of compatible two wire detectors. Uh, JP1 must be set for the two-wire smoke position. For two-wire smokes, the end-of-line resistor is an 820-ohm resistor, so it's different from a regular zone resistor. And then in programming, it must be set for two-wire smoke. We also offer temperature sensors with the, in the M1 product line. And these are excellent sensors for, for showing outdoor temperature or maybe providing temperature monitoring of server rooms or commercial coolers or freezers, maybe a wine cellar, second home, a crawl space, and, and animal habitat, something along those lines. They can measure 
temperature from minus 50 degrees up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now they must connect to a zone on the main board. So you can have up to 16 of them if you were going to max out the system with the zone temperature sensor. And we have a picture of both models here. We have the M1ZTS and a nice new housing. Uh, this is, has the short probe, so it, it fits well onto, onto a wall and doesn't uh, take up much space. Very small, very compact. The other model is the same housing, but it has a seven-foot stainless steel probe. Now, the probe is weatherproof, but it's not waterproof, so it should not be submerged into a liquid, but it's great for monitoring you know, a damp environment or maybe outdoors or in a freezer, something along those lines to, to monitor those temperature readings. Now, those temperature readings can be used in the ELK RP software within the rule engine, so that you can set up a parameter to periodically check for the temperature, and if it's above or below whatever you've set in your rules, you can have an event happen. You can have a, a, a text message or an email, have the keypad start beeping, uh, a voice description. Uh, you could configure it. While it's not necessarily a, a security sensor, uh, it doesn't directly communicate to your central station. You can configure the M1 to trip an output to a zone, another zone on the system, in order to have that situation reported back to your central station. So this is our zone temperature sensors, and this works on the M1 Gold on any of the main zones 1 through 16. Now, for those situations where you need more than 16 zones, we offer a hardwired solution. This is our ELK M1XIN. This is a 16-zone input expander. You can add uh, up to 12 of these onto the M1's data bus, so you can add up to 192 additional zones. Each input expander has a set of four dip switches. That's how the address is set and the address will determine the starting zone number. We also offer wireless solutions in the ELK M1 product line, and we'll take a moment to talk about the ELK two-way wireless product. This is really a unique product in that it's, it's, it's two-way. It offers status feedback to the, uh, to the M1 system, uh, as well as to the sensor itself. So what we're looking at first is the ELK M1X RFTW. This is our wireless transceiver. You can have up to four of these on the M1's data bus. Now, the first one must start at address two. That's very important. And then you can have them address two, three, and four. We can support up to 144 wireless zones. So out of the total 208 available zones, up to 144 of those can be wireless. We offer a wireless glass break sensor, that's the ELK 6040. We have our ELK 6050 sound all smoke detector, and what's unique about it is that it has a built-in sounder, and if the M1 system goes into alarm or another 6050 goes into alarm, all of the built-in sounders of the 6050 start sounding. That's part of the two-way feature of the Elk product, wireless product line, is that if, if one smoke detector goes off, then they all go off. We have our Elk 6011, our single button panic. Our 6023, which are recess window door sensors. These are offered in white and brown. We have our Elk 6010 four button fob as a traditional lock, unlock. The I, we call that our inquiry button. And the purpose of it is, if everyone knows, there's an LED on the sensor here, on the, uh, on the fob. If I press the inquiry button, and the fob's within range of the transceiver, if it lights up green, it means my system is disarmed. If it lights up red, it's armed. If it's flashing red, it means the system has been an alarm. So for those that might be a little leery walking up to their premise, maybe they, they suspect maybe something's happened, they have an uneasy feeling, 
they can press the inquiry button and if it's flashing red then they know it's it perhaps maybe it's not safe to enter the premise it's also a great visual indication if you walk out and you can't remember if you arm the system you can check it using the inquiry button our window door sensors are 6020 our 6021 and 22 they have built-in LEDs also once the sensor receives acknowledgement from the transceiver meaning once the signal gets to the transceiver it'll light up green that's a great indication that the signal was received it's also a great troubleshooting tool if uh, if you're in a situation where you're not quite sure if you have good range or not you can walk around with the sensor and each time you trip it if the light turns green the signal got through if it turns red signal didn't get acknowledged by the transceiver so you know you're without you're uh, out of range of the transceiver in which case you may need a second transceiver on the data bus to help increase that coverage area once again one one transceiver will do up to 144 zones if all of the sensors are within range but if you have a large home or maybe a multi-level home you may need additional transceivers to help increase the coverage area or help to eliminate any dead zones that may exist. Now the 6020 and the 6021 uh, are offered in white or brown. The 6021 is our mini window sensor. This is for uh, vinyl or wood only, non-metallic, very small, very compact. We have our 6022. We call this our universal three zone sensor. It has the built-in read switch for use with the magnet. You can also hardwire two additional zones to this sensor. So one sensor, you can actually have three independent zones. Our 6030 motion detector, which is also available as a 6030P for pet, uh, pet immunity up to 80 pounds. It has a courtesy white LED built into it which can be used as a, as a kind of a nightlight feature or when the system goes into alarm then the LED can start flashing. So it's a very nice unique feature that I'm not sure many other systems offer in a wireless uh, motion detector. So this is the Elk two-way product. A uh, couple features about it is it operates off 902 to 928 megahertz so it's frequency hopping so it's never the same frequency at the same time so it's harder to jam it's harder to detect and jam a frequency hopping signal and it offers us the ability for our two-way capabilities now we're very fortunate that we can also offer other wireless options and once again up to 144 wireless zones on an M1 system. We have the ELK M1XRF2H and this supports Honeywell 5800 series one-way transmitters. Uh, we also offer the ELK M1XRFEG which supports the Interlogic GE or UTC format. It's again only one way so it's uh, you know it sends a signal and then hopefully the signal gets through. But these are the uh, wireless receivers to support these two wireless product lines. Let's take a look at the lower left-hand corner of the M1 circuit board. And this is our power connections. Uh, we have the S-AUX terminals. This is 12-volt DC switched smoke power output for four-wire smokes or for any device that would require a power reset in order to unlatch, uh, like for instance four wire smokes or uh, perhaps any other device, maybe a, a glass break or, or something along those lines, a CO detector that latches in once tripped and in order to unlatch it you would have to drop power off of it. Through keypad programming you can, uh, you can, you can activate the SOX terminal to drop power for five seconds to reset those devices. We have the VOX terminals. We give you three of those on the board. And those are 12 volt DC outputs for powering your motions, your glass breaks, and things of that nature. And the reason we give you three of them is just to help you uh, divide up the wiring so you're not trying to cram 
a, a, a number of wires under two screw terminals. You now have three convenient locations to land those wires, uh, making, making life easier for the installer. It's still the same point as far as protection through the PTC onboard fuse. We'll give you three terminals for convenience. The AC terminal input uses our 16.545VA transformer, the LTRG1640. The master on-off switch is a great and convenient way to cut AC and battery power to the system. So if you're doing a service call or you need to connect equipment to the M1 or something along those lines, you simply move the master on-off switch down and that disconnects power to both the AC transformer and the battery. So there's nothing that you need to unwire in order to power down the system. The battery connections, the, the battery leads on the bottom of the uh, M1 circuit boards for charging up to uh, 18 amp hour sealed lead acid battery. There's an 8 amp hour battery that's included in the kit. A couple items here I want to talk about which may not be um, mention much is we have two little solder pads right here in the very lower left hand corner of the board. And the purpose of these two solder pads is to jump start the system without AC power. So if you're in a situation, it's a construction site and the AC hasn't been finalized yet, but you want to test the system, you can power the M1 up on battery only by moving the on off switch up, shorting across these terminals and that way you can test the system uh, making sure everything's functioning properly without the need for AC power. Now for those situations which you may need more power, we offer the ELK P212S. It's a remote power supply. It is supervised. Uh, the AC and battery are supervised over the M1's data bus. It gives you 12 volt DC at 2 amps. It's perfect for large installations where you need additional power. It does have a programmable output and it's controllable through the M1 rules, so you do have a relay output for uh, maybe switching uh, the, the power to those four wire smokes in the field if they can't get them home run back to the main control. It does use a separate backup battery and transform which aren't included. Now this can fit in the M1 enclosure or you can remotely locate it. It's part, it can be part of the M1's data bus. It can also be a standalone 12 volt DC 2 amp power supply, so it doesn't have to be used with the M1, but it's a great addition to our product line if you do need more power. Brad, I'd like to um, interject with just a couple questions here before we go any further, if that's okay? Sure, absolutely. Um, all right, so um, we had a question about the uh, two-way wireless, and it was just specifically about the ELK 6023. Um, the question is related to the range um, of the device when it is actually installed in, in a door jam into like a 2x4. Okay, that's a great question and um, you know we can open air line of sight for, for the wireless is, is around 300 feet but when you take into consideration construction material whether it be you know drywall, concrete, rebar, metal, those can all degrade the, the signal strength. So it's, it's kind of hard to put a finite number on the range without knowing more about the, uh, the construction material and so forth. Even large appliances and, and even homes with metal lath and stuff, uh, older homes with metal lath can, can affect signal strength. So there's a couple options in the M1 system to help uh, you determine that. We have the walk test mode, which if you trip one of the sensors, the M1 gold will speak a level from 1 to 8, and that's the total number of data packets, uh, 8 being the maximum, 1 being the, the least. So anything 5 or higher would be considered a good signal strength because they got at least over half of the data packets. The ELK 2A wireless, we have the status LED, which that sensor has one too. It's a little hard to see because it's um, the circuit board's in the protective housing there, but uh, it too has a, uh, an acknowledgement LED. And it, it flashes green, the signal got through. If it flashes red, it didn't get through. Now, if you trip it and it takes a, maybe a couple extra seconds before it to turn green, 
that means that it's trying multiple times. So in a scenario like that, you may need to add that second or third wireless transceiver. Okay, thank you for that. And the next question is related to power. What is the maximum current output on the AUX terminals, and does this include the siren speaker and the other outputs on the board? Okay. Uh, under normal operating conditions, you have one amp continuous output. Now, that's a, that's a combination of the keypad bus, J16, output to VOX, and SOX. So, at any given time, you can only draw one amp from the board itself. Now, in alarm condition, you can output two and a half amps with that additional 1.5 amps coming from the battery, uh, backup battery. So one amp under normal conditions, non-alarm, and then two and a half amps under alarm. Thank you. All right. Um, no other questions. We'll move right along with our, our telco connection here. Uh, this is for just regular POTS line hardwired copper connection to the M1, uh, standard tip and ring connection. Uh, you can use an RJ31X. The incoming phone line should be the first thing that the M1 that connects to the M1 first and then house phones downstream for proper line seizure. We here at ELK, we strongly recommend the use of surge suppression on the telco line, so we offer the ELK 952 surge suppressor, and we've given you a block diagram here on how easy it is to actually incorporate it into the uh, installation of the M1 and the, and the phone system. Basically, goes in series with the RJ31X jack. There is a ground connector on it, and it should be earth grounded, uh, preferably to a driven ground rod or metallic cold water pipe or worst case, the, the uh, AC electrical ground of the building. Now, the M1, is, uh, the M1 Gold is unique. It does have telephone remote control capabilities. It always is connected to the phone line. So the M1 knows when the phone is ringing, when it goes off hook, or if somebody lifts the handset and dials either star, 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 or star, zero, star to access the voice prompt of the M1 system. It's a little different from other security systems which switch in the telco when, uh, when it needs to dial out. The M1 is always connected to the incoming phone line. So that's the reason we really recommend uh, surge suppression because unfortunately, um, you know, Lightning loves telephones and, and, and AC, so, so we really encourage use of uh, surge suppression uh, when connecting the telephone. And we also offer a separate one for the AC power. Uh, it's called the ELP 950. So we have a, a couple different options for surge suppression for telephone and low voltage AC. Now, like Amy mentioned earlier, the uh, ELK M1 Gold does have two-way listening capability. And primarily, this is for central station verification on alarms, you know, to avoid those unnecessary dispatch of authorities or emergency personnel due to a false alarm or things of that nature. Uh, customers can also use this uh, through the M1's telephone remote control capability if they want to check on loved ones. So they can call into the system, access the voice prompts, and then go into the audio listen-in so that they can listen in to the residents. Now, we offer two audio listen-in interfaces. The first one is the ELK M1TWI. This is the standard interface. So this was where your microphones would connect to, and then the, the speakers connect to output one on the main board. This one just does uh, the two-way listen-in. The next option is the ELK M1TWA. This is our amplified interface, and it has a couple nice unique features in it that it has three zones for your speaker output, and each speaker output, uh, you can load that down to four ohms, you can have multiple speakers, has volume control. There's a little volume control on each branch, and there's three of them here. Now, 
this may be valuable for somebody who has a multi-level home and the upper level, the sleeping area, may not need to be as loud as the common area downstairs. So you can set the volume of what the M1 is speaking lower up there. You know, maybe it's near a baby's room or somebody who works evenings and, and, and sleeps more during the day, so they don't necessarily need to hear the M1 speaking. In the common area would be a little louder volume. So that's controllable through the M1 TWA. You also have the capability of muting these zones. So, for instance, at the baby's area, you know, maybe upstairs, you can mute that speaker during certain times of the day. Now, if the system does go into alarm, it overrides that rule, and so it would be enunciating to all of the speakers then when an alarm takes place. That's uh, just a couple features of the Elk M1 TWA. It says amplified interface has individual volume control for each zone, and you can have up to 12 microphones connected to either one of them. Now, on the right-hand side of our slide is the M1 TWS. This is a speaker microphone combination. It is surface mount only. We have our M1 TWSF, which is a speaker microphone flush mount. This would fit into a single gang outlet, and you have our speaker and the microphone board incorporated into the one unit. And we also offer the microphone only, and that's the Elk M1 TWM. You see it right here, so you can remotely locate just the microphone. All right, below the telephone connection is the main serial port on the M1. Now, this um, we call this serial port zero, and it is used in one of the following ways. You can connect the new Elk C1 M1, our dual path communicator, uh, to, uh, to this port. You, or you can connect the M1 XEP to this port. Or third party interfaces such as AMX, Control 4, Crestron, and so forth. They also connect to this port. Or you can connect a PC to this port. So there's uh, several methods or means or devices that could connect to serial port zero on the on the M1 main board. Now if you're we're going to talk a little bit more about C1 M1 and, and XEP and so forth. So but this is a, this is a primary communication port for software as well as third party integration. Now this is a, a standard RS232 connection. It utilizes three pins within the connector, pin two to two, three to three, and five to five. Uh, the pin out there is at the bottom, and we would not recommend going more than 50 feet when trying to connect a uh, serial connection to the M1 circuit board. Now let's take a moment to talk about the C1 M1. This is our dual path alarm communicator. It is new. It's a new product from Elk Products. It's super fast communication to your central station over IP and, and or cellular. Uh, it certainly reduces the transmission time for emergency messages because there's no dial capture, there's no data bus decoding which can lead to delays, there's no cloud server involved to compromise or delay that communication. It's basically going from the M1 through the C1 M1 to your central station. It auto detects uh, which path is available, so it's uh, primarily going to be IP, but if IP is down, it's going to go cellular, or it can be configured to be IP only or cellular only. So it's super fast communication. The one we're looking at now is the Elk C1 M1 uh, 4GSM for the AT&T network, and coming next month will be the C1 M1 CDMA for the Verizon network. Uh, both models will offer some remote access with no port forwarding or extra fees associated. This is great for remote access over IP or cellular. It allows for remote programming of the M1 system with the RP software. Uh, allows remote control of the M1 from software and the apps uh, like ElkLink, the mobile app for, for the iOS and the Android. M1 to go, which is our uh, PC-based software, 
as well as the third-party apps eKeypad and M1 Touch. The cell, right now, the cell, for the C1 M1 for GSM, uh, the, the cellular service and billing and so forth is being provided through Telguard. The next option that would connect to serial port zero is the Ethernet module, the ELK M1 XEP. It's used to connect the M1 to the local area network uh, for remote access and programming locally and remotely. Uh, it's a secure connection. It does allow you for email and text event notifications as well as internet monitoring and reporting, URL updating using a dynamic DNS service as well as syncing with a national time server. All right, let's talk about the outputs on the board. Output 1 is our voice and siren output. This is for speakers only. Typically this would be used for interior speakers connected to the, to the M1 system. You can have multiple speakers connected as long as you do not drop below 4 ohms. And output 1 gives you your voice announcements uh, for, your, for your automation or to let, alert you when zones are opening and closing and so forth. Does the siren sounds when the system goes into alarm. Output 2 is a supervised siren output. It's a programmable output. You can set it to use the built-in Siren driver, in which case you'd use speakers. Once again, uh, no more than uh, no lower than a four ohm load, or you can set it to a voltage output for self-contained sirens or or strobes or so forth. And when it is set to a voltage output, it's rated at 12 volt DC at one amp. So make sure that if you're using a powered device, that it doesn't consume more than one amp of current. If you're not using output two. Uh, since it is a supervised output, you'd want to make sure you install the 2.2K ohm resistor across it to avoid that output 2 trouble condition. Without the resistor, you'll have output 2 trouble on the keypad. And make sure you do use a resistor and not a dead short, because dead short would damage output 2. So resistor only if not being used. Output 3 is a general purpose Form C relay and it's programmable using the ELK RP rule engine. It's uh, rated at uh, 12 to 24 volt DC at about 4 amps. Output 7 through 16 are low voltage outputs. Uh, once again, these are, are programmable through the ELK RP rule engine. Uh, they're rated at 12 volt DC at 50 milliamps positive switch for each output. Uh, if you're using the M1 EZ8, it too has output 7 through 16, but they're 12 volt at 10 milliamps each. A little difference between the two boards there. You can convert outputs 9 through 16 to physical relays by using the ELK M1 RB. So we give you a, a double-ended wiring harness similar to the picture here and plugs into J16. The other end plugs into the M1 RB. And now you have uh, outputs 9 through 16 being physical form C relays. Now for additional output expansion, like for controlling garage doors or sprinklers or pumps or just uh, LED indicators, we have the ELK M1XOVR, and that's part of the M1 uh, connects to the M1's data bus, so you can have it at the control or you can remotely locate it. There are eight onboard relays, once again those are Form C general purpose relays, as well as eight low voltage outputs. Now you can convert the low voltage outputs by using the M1RB, so by the combination of both boards you can have 16 Form C relays. And you can have up to 205 total outputs on the M1 board. So you can, you can add up to 12 of the XOVRs and 12 of the ELK M1 RBs to get you up to 205 outputs.
Let's talk about uh, any questions at the moment, Amy. We do have a question about the um, RS-232 connection. Um, is there a way to have an RS-232 connection for third-party systems and an Ethernet communicator on the same M1 Gold? No. Um, well, a lot of our third-party integrators, uh, such as um, uh, some of the software developers, have created drivers that support local area network communication, in which case all of the communication is coming through either the C1M1 or the M1XEP. So if you use a C1M1 or an M1XEP, that takes up serial port zero, so no other device could physically connect, but it is possible through the LAN drivers to communicate to either one of those. Now, for those that uh, for those devices that don't have LAN drivers, we offer a optional device called the ELK IP232. It's a serial to Ethernet bridge that could be used uh, to connect the serial port of a device to the local air network, and then through a setup utility, have the M1 communicating back and forth to this third-party device. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, data bus connections. The data bus in the lower right-hand corner of the M1 is where you're going to connect your, your keypads, your input expanders, your output expanders, your supervised power supplies, and a serial port expander. All those are, are data bus devices. The M1 can, can accept no more than two home runs connected to the main board. Um, if you're using four conductor, for instance, you could daisy chain devices together like we have in our diagram here, and you can connect uh, daisy chaining, making sure that the last device would get terminated. Now, because we actually are using an, a 485 data bus, which is communicating at 38,400 baud rate, there's some special wiring configuration requirements that must be uh, followed. One is the no more than two home runs. The other is to make sure that the end of each home run is properly terminated, and we do that by using a black jumper included in the hardware kit to engage a 120 ohm resistor. So at the uh, at both ends, there would be 120 ohm resistor at both ends. So the overall resistance across the data bus A and B should be between 60 and 70 ohms, something in that range. And also the overall length of the data bus should not exceed 4,000 feet. So if we're starting at the M1 and we're home running, uh, let's say, for instance, in our example down here, we have our two home runs. Uh, each one of these home runs could be no more than 2,000 feet apiece for a total of 4,000 feet. Because we have the two home runs, the last device, in this case, an input expander and a keypad would have the terminating jumpers installed to engage those 120 ohm resistors. If I had only a single home run, let's say, for instance, this bottom uh, home run did not exist, then my terminating jumper would be actually on the M1 and on the last device on that single home run. So there should always be two terminating resistors on the M1 system. Now we offer a couple different means to wire the data bus. We offer a data bus hub, the M1DBH. This is for new installations. And this uses a CAT5 or a CAT6 wiring, uh, which you would go from the hub to the device. You would terminate the home run at the DBH using an RJ45. And what this does is this now, this hub, does the daisy chaining for you. Um, depending on the installer, some have no problem daisy chaining devices. 
a lot of installers like to home run back to the control, so I would suggest the DBH hub, in which case, and you can terminate each home run. Now, because it's, the hub is doing the daisy chaining for you, it's bringing a return path back to the control. So therefore, we have to calculate each home run now doubled because of the return path. But the DBH hub makes for a nice, neat, clean installation. And if you need, this one here has nine ports. If you need additional hubs, you can daisy chain them together. Or you could have two of them in parallel, because uh, that would still be considered two home runs coming off the control. And instead of terminating the device, we offer a terminating plug. It's an RJ45 plug that has the resistor built into it. Another means of wiring for the M1's data bus is the M1 DBHR for retrofit. So if you have an existing system that, that you're going to replace with an M1, but it has multiple four-wire home runs back, you can use the retrofit hub, which will then, um, it's an active hub. So each one of these branches here is its own 485 data bus and therefore each one must be configured using the 485 data bus parameters so no more than two home runs per branch each branch would need to be pop, uh, properly terminated and its control must be termi uh, terminated properly as well now because this is an active hub there's a lot a lot of uh, information being passed back and forth across these branches. So it's very, very, very important to make sure that the DBHR is located as close to the control as possible. You can have a maximum of two DBHRs on one system. Both of them would have to be at the control and it is not, absolutely not possible to connect a DBHR to a branch of another one. So, so definitely not uh, try to do that. All right, let's talk about wiring for the DBH. Right now we're looking at, uh, let's say for instance, this is a keypad. We have our wiring harness off of our keypad. This is about a six inch wiring harness. You would home run your CAT5 from the DBH all the way to the device. You would make these wiring connections, the brown wires for power. We have our orange and our green for data A. We have white orange and white green for data B. And you can see here how the these would connect inside the RJ45. This is using uh, 568A wiring configuration. So we have a return path. We have the data going out to the keypad and then back to the DBH so that it can go out onto the next available port to another device. So this is how we would wire for the M1 DBH hub. Ah, we're going to throw a little pop quiz in here real quick. Um, Based upon what I what I said earlier, as far as termination of the data bus, we now have an example here where we have the M1 main control, and then we have a single home run which we daisy chain two keypads together. So everyone, take just a moment, look over this diagram, and determine where the terminating jumpers, the little black jumpers, should be installed. So. We'll give everyone here just a few seconds to look over this. All right. So if you said A and C, you'd be correct because this is a single home run. Therefore, the last device on the home run would receive the terminating jumper, as well as the control itself. That's the JP3 uh, spot on the M1 Gold. That engages 220 ohm resistors. So uh, if you should happen to call tech support, and we may ask you at some point to power down the system and measure the resistance across A and B, 
it should be between 60 and 70 ohms if it's seen both resistors. Uh, it doesn't tell us if A and B are wired correctly because they still could be reversed, but at least let us know if it's seen the total number of resistors because if you accidentally put a uh, terminating jumper on this center, the first keypad, that would be three jumpers, so your overall resistance would be way too low. All right, let's take another example here. We now have two home runs coming off the control. So we have a four conductor, which we daisy chained two keypads together. And now we have a four conductor where we're daisy chaining some input expanders. So take a moment and determine where the terminating jumper or jumpers would be installed. And C and F would be the correct um, answer here because the last device on each home run, because now the M1 is considered in the middle. So we have ones, daisy chain devices together, terminating jumper on the last device of each home run. Now we're going to see if everyone is paying attention. We're going to ask about the DBH hub. So in this case, we have our hub, and we have multiple devices, home run, back to the hub, and each one of them is terminated with an RJ45. So take a moment, look over the diagram, and let's see where the terminating jumper would be installed. All right, if you said A and G, you would be correct. But that's, that's because we now have basically a, a home run scenario, which the DBH hub is daisy chaining these devices together for us. So the last, or I'm sorry, the first unused port on the hub would have the terminating plug installed here. And because it's only one home run going out, JP3 on the control would be terminated. And once again, if we power down and measure the resistance across A and B, we should see around 60 to 70 ohms. Now in this example, we're going to use our retrofit hub, which must be located as close to the control as possible. We have a single home run coming from the retrofit hub to the M1. And now we have devices. We have a single home run. We have two home runs, two home runs, and a single home run coming to the DBHR hub, the retrofit hub. So let's take a moment, look over this, and we'll explain where the terminating jumpers need to be placed. Let's take a look at the green check marks. This is where the terminating jumpers would be installed. Now, the reason we have A and B is because we have a single home run going from the M1 to the retrofit hub. So we terminate here and here. If we look at branch one, it's a single home run. So the last device gets terminated as well as the branch. That's JP2. Remember, these are active branches. So, so each one is its own unique 485 data bus. Branch 2 has two home runs coming off of it, so we terminate each device, but not the branch itself. Branch 3 follows that same scenario, two home runs. This home run actually has two devices daisy chained together, so the last device is terminated on each home run but not the branch itself. Lastly, branch four, it's a single home run, 
So the device is terminated as well as the branch. So it may look a little confusing, but uh, we've got some great documentation to explain that with inside the M1 DBHR installation manual. You can always contact us if you have any questions at all. That's, uh, that's our pop quiz here for data bus examples. Amy, do we have any questions at this moment? Um, so what if nothing is connected to a branch on the retrofit hub? Okay, well if, if nothing is connected then you can you can leave the terminating jumper on the branch itself. It'll be fine. Okay. So um, we will be having another webinar next Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time and in that webinar we're going to go over the programming of the M1 system with our ELK RP software. So be sure to join us for that. We'll um, go over all of the programming that would be rela related to the things that you've seen today as far as hardware is concerned. So it's a, a definitely a good uh, follow-up email to, or excuse me, follow-up webinar to, to attend. Um, we will be sending you a link in the uh, follow-up email that we send to you next week so that you can sign up for that webinar or you can find a link to that on our website now. Um, so be sure to, to be looking for that. And we appreciate everyone attending today. Again, we do want to reiterate that we will be sending you a follow-up email. You'll be getting a copy of the presentation that we used today. Um, you'll be getting a link to a recording of this webinar, an inv invitation to next week's webinar, and some other resources that we think you may find uh, helpful, including you know, question and answer and that sort of thing. If you do have any other questions, um, you know, we've got a couple minutes here if you want to go ahead and get some other questions in. But otherwise, we really do appreciate your attendance and just hope that uh, if you have any questions after the webinar um, or you, you just need some additional help, um, reach out to us. Uh, you can email training at elkproducts.com. You'll also find a lot of information on our website. Um, if you go to elkproducts.com, you'll see you know, a great deal of uh, documentation manuals, that sort of thing. All different kinds of videos are on our YouTube channel from other webinars that we've had. We have a support forum, so we've just got a lot of different ways that you can reach out to us. You can also reach our tech support department department by phone. Um, you'll find our 800 number on our website. And again, uh, if, if no other questions, uh, I guess uh, we'll, you know, hope you have a great weekend. All right. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Hopefully, everyone got some good information. I, I certainly appreciate Amy taking time to put this together and helping me out. And we look forward to the next one.